welcome to Equity Summit 2018, our power, our future, our nation. The fierce urgency of now requires that each of us be able to say yes to this notion of our worthiness. Like Dr. King says, I refuse to accept the idea that the isness of man's present nature makes us morally incapable for reaching the oughtness that forever confronts us. When Angela talks about that radical imagination, that is the oughtness. And I know if we join arms and lock them together, we're going to create a society where all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. So I'm looking forward to working with you. I want you to know that I love you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Orbert Davis. I'm the art co-founder, artistic director of Chicago Jazz Philharmonic. Uh, let's talk about friends for a second. I'm a friend, and you're a friend. We have friends who are very near to us, very dear to us. We have friends who are far away, but they'll always be our friend. We have friends who are just mere acquaintances, and some who are part of us. You know what I mean? You have friends. I have friends. I have a friend who came to America in pursuit of greater educational opportunities. <laughs> And I have a friend who was the first in his family to travel many miles to America in search of employment opportunities. I have a friend whose ancestors came to America to escape wars and famines. I have a friend whose great-grandparents came to America to escape a severe holocaust. <laughs> so brother number one over there. <laughs> That is important. And the skin that the Latino community has in the game is that we have to demonstrate every single day that we're American and that we sacrifice with people who have fought for this country, died for this country, and right now are becoming the fastest folks that are going into the prison industry. And if we do not stand up as a collective country to demand our vision and our values, we have to pack up. And so when I see people march in the streets, marching is a lot much harder than voting because you are putting your body in the face of people of this is what I represent. But that marching does not translate if we don't go to the voting booths. That's right. And so it's hard. That's why we get up every single day because we recognize that the stakes are so high that the people that are occupying the institutions are the ones that are determining the policy of the institution. So my work and the work of folks here and in this room is to occupy those institutions. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the only way we occupy is through that voting booth. Right. So I can tell you that I'm a little angry. I'm very, very angry, but it's, I always say that I'm pissed with purpose right now. Who else is pissed with purpose? Raise your hand. I'm pissed with purpose. How do we tell the full force and grasp of the story? The fact that undocumented Asians are actually the fastest growing undocumented yes. population in this country. The fact that we rarely talk about undocumented black immigrants. Mm -hmm. And the fact that because of systematic racism, detention and deprecation rates are higher. The fact that white people, I don't know where you all came from, <laughs> <laughs> and what papers you had when you showed up, right? But the reality is, unless you're Native American, <laughs> I mean, really, though. So right now, I'm really, and no, I'm sorry, I'm a journalist. So I like facts. In this country, in the next 50 years, there, I don't know if you know this, there are 43 million immigrants in America today. 
43 million. According to the Pew Research Center, we are going to constitute 88% of the total U.S. population growth in the next 50 mm -hmm. years. Yeah. So basically, a country that can't talk about race and talk about black people without having a panic attack is now going to have to talk about Asians and Latinos and mixed race people, right? And try to figure out that when we really say defining American, we're defining it as fully as we possibly can. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's our job. Um, and it's okay. And we're, and we're proud of the movement that we built. But our focus right now is electoral politics. And Maria said it. I don't care how much marching you do. If you ain't marching your you-know-whats to the polls, then you ain't really in this movement and don't really understand. And the other thing that we're pushing forth is put your self-righteous politics to the side. Stop telling me about your feelings and how you like this person. You know, like, this election is about alleviating suffering and stopping the bleeding in our community. So I don't care who you like, who you don't like. Go to the polls and vote for black people and vote for undocumented people and vote for queer people and vote for Muslims and immigrants and refugees and vote for unions and, and collective bargaining. Vote for the issues, don't vote for your personal feelings, which is another thing, unfortunately, that we deal with in the movement, Angela, where people think it's about them. It ain't about you. It ain't about your feelings. And, and, the, and this country has to just come to terms with this right here. This is it. This is the resistance right here, and this is who's leading the resistance. Other people can claim they're leading the resistance. We're leading the resistance. And it is because people who are closest to the pain are closest to the solution. Mm -hmm. And we do got resources in this country. Mm -hmm. Not only do we, as in the collective country, but we as communities of color got resources. Do we got poor people in our community? We sure do. Mm -hmm. But I tell people all the time, a lot of the resources that I have, my community funds me. They are invested in the progress that we have the potential to put forth in this country. I tell people all the time, you know damn sure well at the Radisson, you paid $5 for a latte. <laughs> and I always tell people, what if you put $5 a week, $20 a month, and gave it to a local grassroots organization in your community, and were a sustainable donor yeah, to an right. organization? We have so much power, and we've been told for so long, you got no power. I got power. I know I have power. So we also have to remember that we, uh, we, we literally, in my opinion, we offend communities of color yeah. by trying to act like Trump all of a sudden is yeah. the oppression that has been introduced to our lives. He's not. Yeah. He's the accumulation of it. Yeah. And what I'll also say is that, and I say this all the time, and people know me, it's not a mantra. I don't tweet this. I don't hashtag it. I live it every day. Let the black woman lead and just follow them and shut up. That's just my <laughs> That's it. And, and I'll tell you this. In my personal, yes. in my personal opinion, if, if, if black women, if black women are straight and got everything they need and they're happy, everybody's Everybody's happy. Gonna be happy. Everybody's happy. Everybody's happy. That's what I mean. On solidarity. We have to focus on solidarity, transformative solidarity in a divided nation. That is what we want to explore, and it means having to cross lines we haven't crossed, to meet people we haven't met, to understand struggles that we have felt have not been our own, but now we know that they are. Or anybody's house for dinner, and that was one of several things that yeah. helped you to see. And what you said is that seeing really seeing is the road to transformation. See, sight is yeah, transformation. But you can't, yes, that's mm -hmm. correct. You can't, but you can't see what you don't look at. Mm -hmm. You're doing the minimal stuff of being nice to somebody else. If you don't invite them in, include them, then they are, by definition, excluded. And they don't feel welcome. And so what do they choose to do? Go where they can feel welcome and they can feel loved. And so I guess our, our big challenge, writ large, with government and the neighborhoods and our families is to make people really feel welcome and to be open. And at the end of the day, understand that it's just as much your loss as it is their loss because y'all never had the joy and the pleasure of sharing with each other. And so to end on the great diaspora, can you imagine of those five million people that, that left the South because they didn't feel welcome, mm. how many individuals and how much talent and love and intellectual capital and creative talent the South lost because those people left, and what, and what the country could be, and how many artists and playwrights and musicians and scientists and astronauts and presidents there are out there that we don't get the benefit of because they don't have access to education or to health care 
or the pipeline to prison reform is taking them in a direction they don't want to go and think about the incredible loss and then turn it into, well, just think about the incredible opportunity and the hope that the nation really could have if we could really walk the walk that we've all talked about as we aspire to become that more perfect union. That could get you up out of your seat. That yeah. could get you excited and that can get you hopeful about what's yet to come in our country. Um, the South African uh, Zulu word is Sabawanu, as, as talked about by uh, Alvin Herring, who's the new head of PICO. Um, and Sabawanu means, I see you. Mm -hmm. Not, I'm looking at you. Not, I'm following you around the store to see what you're going to take. <laughs> <laughs> it means, I see you. And it means, I see you, I see your ancestors before you, and I see your children and your lineage after you. And the response is, I am here. Uh, so whiteness is a concept. <laughs> it's a concept that was invented by the elites for domination, for control, for separation. One reason it's so hard in the, in the country, and one reason that people literally, I mean, there were white people who said they couldn't get out of bed when Obama was elected president, uh, because they, their identity is bound up in dominance. When, when, when W.B. Du Bois said there's a psychological benefit to whiteness, and we keep missing that. We said we're going to give them more money, we're going to give them health care, we're going to give them housing. Truman, when he was president of the United States, he came this close to passing universal health care. Mm -hmm. And the South was on board, because the South needed health care more than anybody. And then at the 11th hour, they said, President Truman, we have a question to ask you. If we have universal health care, will we have to go to the hospitals with black people? <laughs> Truman said, said yes. They said, we don't we'll be it. sick. We don't <laughs> want to go. We'll, we'd rather die. Okay. So I guess what I'm saying is, yes, that, that, um, that it's whiteness. I mean, when we talk about race, people want to talk about black people, mm -hmm. or maybe brown people. But the hard edge of, and, and I'll end with this, mm -hmm. I know we have time. James Baldwin said, it's no, it's no hope for them as long as they think they're white. So we got to get rid of this whiteness. And I don't mean, you know. I know exactly what you mean. In a loving way.